Welcome back to Operating Systems. In the previous lecture we took a look at general approaches to managing the main memory of a computer and we also introduced the idea of virtual memory using segmentation and paging. So today we'll take a closer look at how virtual memory actually works in practice. So to revisit memory management uh, we have seen already that the operating system has to collaborate closely with the hardware so we can efficiently perform memory management and we've seen two major approaches for this segmentation and page based addressing both requiring hardware support and segmentation as well as page based addressing realize some implicit indirections so this means that the addresses generated by the CPU are only logical or virtual addresses which have some relation to physical memory but this relation is controlled by a part of your computer called the memory management unit and this memory management unit can then do an address translation of virtual addresses to physical addresses and this implies that you can keep the virtual addresses the same so you can keep your uh, global addresses inside of your process so you don't have to change anything at runtime while moving memory around in main memory and uh, to do this the operating system has to make a number of strategic decisions so first it has to decide on a placement strategy and we've seen several of these like first fit best fit or the body algorithm and we've also seen already that th those approaches differ in the resulting fragmentation as well as the overhead for uh, the memory allocation and for memory release and there is no ideal strategy for all use cases but the sele selection of a certain strategy depends on the expected profile of your application and uh, when you are swapping segments or you are paging you need uh, in addition a loading strategy and also a replacement strategy and we'll talk about replacement strategies especially for paging in this lecture here so one effect you can observe when you look at the memory access patterns of processes is that there is a certain locality to be found. So uh, the execution of single instructions in your processor only requires the presence of very few memory pages. So that means a single instruction may for example access the page it is located in, in the text segment, and maybe a couple of data pages like it loads or stores a value to main memory. And this strong locality uh, is interesting to observe because it manifests itself also over longer periods of time uh, and this is because of several reasons for example because instructions are usually executed one after the other if you don't do a jump or an exception and even if you run in a loop uh, so you're jumping back to the beginning of a loop loops are relatively short so even these successes to code inside of a loop happen within a small region of memory so this locality can be exploited when the system is running out of available main memory and there are a large number of approaches to do this. One is overlays, that was an approach that was used frequently in the 1970s where you had very small main memories but already rather large programs and data sizes. So in this diagram on the right hand side here on the x-axis you see the execution time of a process while it progresses through its instructions and on the left hand side is a, uh, yeah, a list of the pages of the address space of our process here. So uh, each of these numbers here might be a different page. And now these patterns you see are locality patterns. So you see that very many accesses that are close together in time only access a small part of the whole memory. So for example, in this whole time area here, there's only access to this part and maybe that part of the mem uh, memory here. But we don't have any excesses here and uh, this can change over uh, your program faces as we call them so for example back here we have a large number of excesses to that formerly unaccessed area here and a smaller number of excesses down here but no excesses up here and here in the middle so we can make use of this if we can ensure that if we have a smaller memory for example than would be available here that we exactly have these pages in memory at the respective times in our program execution that are actually used at these times. So what we need is to figure out methods to find out which pages are actually required at a certain point in time of our program execution. So 
Uh, what we do with virtual memory is we decouple the requirements that a process has to uh, its memory address space from the available amount of main memory we have in our computer. Uh, we've seen that processes do not access all memory locations with the same frequency, so uh, certain instructions in your program are used, so executed only very infrequently or maybe not at all. So we've already discussed the printer function in a text processing system, which is obviously only used uh, when you print a page or a document and some other code might not be used at all, for example, error handling code, which obviously is only used when something goes wrong. So if everything goes uh, in the right way with your program, you don't execute this error handling code at all. And all, this is not, all, not only valid for instructions, but also for data. So certain data structures may only be used partially, so only to a certain percent of the memory that's allocated for them. So the rest of the memory allocated for a data structure remains unused because maybe we have a large area of a thousand elements but we're only processing the first 100 of these. Uh, so this means that we want to allow processes to use more memory than uh, which is available as main memory in our computer. So we can run larger processes, larger, use larger data sets or even larger instruction segments than what is available in our main memory. So the idea behind virtual memory here is to create an, yet another illusion. So the illusion that we have a very large main memory, even if we couldn't afford to buy that much physical RAM. Uh, so uh, we do this by making the currently used memory areas available in main memory. And if there's an access attempted by a process to a page that's currently not present in main memory, because we are running out of memory, we need to intercept this access and then we need to provide the required memory areas on demand. So we have to provide the contents of these memory areas that are requested at a certain moment in time when these are requested. And uh, if we run out of memory by well loading in some additional information into main memory, we actually have to kick something else out of our main memory. So we have to swap our page out some memory areas which are currently not used. But of course, these may be used later on when our program is doing something else. So here is an example of demand paging. What we have here on the left hand side is our virtual address space of our process. So all these addresses here, all these are like page numbers are virtual. So we have like 13 pages here in the virtual address space of our process. And uh, we have a smaller main memory. So we have the main memory in this example here consisting of uh, seven pages in our main memory and uh, the mapping between the page addresses of our virtual address space and the page frames of our physical memory is performed using our page table here. So our page table has entries and these entries tell us if a certain page related to a virtual address here, for example, uh, is present in memory. So we have the presence bit which is indicated by one, or if it's not present, which is indicated by zero, or if we maybe have some unused virtual address space here uh, in, in our process. So you see for each virtual uh, page here in our process address space, we have a corresponding entry in our page table for this process. So each process has its own page table as it has its own virtual address space. And so we can actually map a page number to an entry in our page table. Of course, this is a very simplified uh, graphics here demonstrating the concept in real life. It's a bit more complicated. Now, in addition, we also have background storage. So background storage is some sort of disk usually. Uh, and this background storage either has a dedicated partition, which we call a swap space, or on more modern operating system, it can also be uh, just a specific, uh, specific file, a swap file in one of the file systems of your computer. And in this background storage, you can store page frame contents. So essentially, this background storage is split up into elements which have the same size as a physical page frame and accordingly the same size as a uh, page in virtual memory. And you see this background storage can contain the contents of certain pages in memory. And this is used to
to store contents of pages when you're running out of main memory. So let's take a look at what happens when a process is running and it's currently executing code in page number two here. And page number two contains an instruction that uh, loads a value into a register from a page, which is page F. So uh, what do we have to do to actually figure out where to load this value from physical memory? Now the CPU generates this address in page F. So page F seems to have an entry here in the virtual address space. And when we look at our page table here, we see page F has an entry uh, with a number of 11, but its present spit is set to zero. So this indicates we are unable, as we can see here, to find this page as a page frame in physical memory currently. So we know it needs to be fetched into physical memory from our background storage. So when our MMU detects such an access with a present spit of zero, it generates a trap inside of the CPU and this trap leads to a con uh, context switch to the operating system's page fault handler. And this page fault handler now is responsible for bringing in the information into main memory. So what these, uh, this page fault handler does is it searches the background storage for the requested memory page and it found it here. And then it needs to actually find a free page frame in memory. So page frame zero in memory was free before. So now it can copy the contents of page F from background storage here into this page frame zero in main memory, which now has some useful contents. So the next thing our operating system has to do is to inform the MMU that this page containing this uh, virtual page F is now in memory at location page frame zero. So this former entry that contained an information 11, zero, so not present, and it's at location 11 in our background storage needs to be updated in order for the operating system and the process later on to now find uh, contents of page F in main memory at page frame zero. So the operating system has now updated the contents of this MMU entry here. So its presence bit is set to one. And since the operating system has copied this uh, page from the background storage to our page frame zero now, we change its location in our page table to indicate that we can find the contents of our virtual page F now at our physical page frame zero. Now, uh, we are still in the operating system. So the next thing the operating system has to do is to ensure that this value can now be loaded successfully from main memory. And it does this by instructing the CPU to actually restart this instruction that tried to load the value, which wasn't in main memory. So this access is performed once more. So now uh, again, this instruction tries to load a register from our page F. So it references our page table again here for page F. Now it finds the information. Okay, you should be able to find the re uh, requested information in physical page frame zero. And since this page is now in main memory, the access can be performed, the value can be loaded and our program can continue to run. Now, of course, as you've seen, as soon as a page is already in main memory, the access is fast. So we have to do this translation step through the MMU. But after that, actually, we can directly load this value from main memory into whatever our register or wherever we want to load it. So if we have a situation where no page faults occur, so all information is in main memory, our effective access time to code or data is depending on the CPU somewhere in the range of 10 to 200 nanoseconds. But when a page fault occurs, you have seen that a very complex process starts. So first the MMU figures out, okay, this page is not contained in main memory. Then it has to generate that trap to the operating system. The operating system then has to search for that page in your background storage, which is a relatively slow disk and load it from disk, uh, copy it to main memory, and then finally update 
the MMU page table entry and restart the instruction that originally generated the page fault. So what happens when a page fault occurs? Now let's uh, analyze this a bit more quantitatively and let's assume we have a probability of a page fault uh, which we call P and we assume that the time required to page in a page from background memory is around 25 milliseconds. So a whole order of magnitude, so a, a thousand times slower than main memory access here. And this 25 millisecond number might be composed of 8 milliseconds of latency, 15 milliseconds of positioning time, and 1 or 2 milliseconds of transfer time for the block. Now if we assume a normal access time of mem for memory of relatively slow 100 nanoseconds compared to our even slower 15 milliseconds, then we can calculate the effective overall, overall access time to be, well, 100 nanoseconds in, pay, in case of no page fault, so 1 minus p, because p is the probability of a page fault, plus the probability of a page fault times, oh my god, 25 million. So this is, uh, well, around 100, because we can approximate this to 1, plus, uh, well, uh, almost 25 million times p. And this is, of course, very large if p is large. So we need to know that the page fault rate is extremely low to ensure that we have efficient demand paging because otherwise our overhead for just reading in pages would be dominated by this factor on the right hand side here. So P eff effectively has to be very close to zero in order for a system to work efficiently. In addition, our virtual memory system has a number of advantages when it comes to typical tasks of the operating system. So especially when we do process creation, we've seen that Unix performs a copy on write approach. So uh, essentially pages are only copied to a child process whenever a page is modified. So uh, we originally share pages using shared MMU entries here. So we have the same physical pages for a parent and a child process. And uh, this stays the same as long as none of the both involved processes tries to write to a page and as soon as one of the processes actually tries to write to a page only this page is duplicated and this is very, of course very easy to implement if we have a paging MMU because we have a more fine-grained memory uh, uh, structure here compared to very large data and code segments which contain all the data or all the code of your process. It also means that we can interleave program and execution and loading because we actually don't have to load the complete program at once when we start a program, which takes a relatively long time. But what we do is we only load one page of a program at a time when it's requested. And Unix actually takes this to an extreme. When a process is started, so using uh, exec on uh, Linux or Unix, actually no single page is loaded from disk at all. The first page that's loaded, uh, it is actually only loaded when the first instruction is uh, executed or should be executed in the newly loaded process uh, because that one directly, because its page is not in memory, generates a page fault. So as a, a reaction to the page fault, the operating system then pages in this single page where this instruction is in and then this instruction might generate additional page faults because it might load data and so on. So we accumulate a set of used pages one after the other while a program is in execution. So we never need to load the whole program in advance before we start it. And that's very efficient, obviously. Uh, but of course, what we need uh, also when we uh, run Unix processes, if we need to be able to lock the access to pages, for example, if we have provided the uh, pointer to a buffer in our address space to the operating system uh, for disk transfer and the operating system instructs the peripheral device to directly copy data into this process address space, for example using direct memory access, uh, then we would need to lock the access to a page until this transfer has been successfully performed. Now in theory we could also use something called demand segmentation, so instead of swapping in pages, we would swap in whole segments, but this has a number of disadvantages. First, the granularity is very coarse, so we could only swap the complete code or the complete data or the complete stack segment, which are of course larger than a typical 
page in our paging memory system. Uh, this makes main memory allocation more difficult. With paging, if we have a free page frame, we can use it for every allocation because all page frames have the same size of, for example, four kilobytes. Uh, but when you try to swap segments, you have the problem again of finding an appropriate gap in your memory space. And this is more difficult, this has more overhead. In addition, it also makes background memory allocation more difficult because background memory swap space is allocated in the same granularity as a page and this granularity is fixed to, for example, our four kilobytes. Whereas if we used segments of uh, differing sizes for differing processes, we would also need to find uh, the respective, uh, respective space for it in swap space. So this is also more overhead. Uh, so that led to the development that in practice demand paging has won over any segmentation approaches, even if it requires a bit more hardware overhead. So we need our, uh, to ask ourselves what we have to do when we're actually running out of free main memory. So what happens if there is no free page frame available in main memory, so they're all used, uh, so allocated to some of the processes or the operating system. And uh, if this is the case and some additional request for a page comes in. Now, obviously we can't fit more pages into main memory than its capacity has. So we have to kick another page frame out of main memory. So we have to preempt this page from memory uh, to create space for the new page. Now, uh, which page should we select for this? So the easiest pages to select are pages which have only been read since they have been brought into main memory. So if we have pages for which we know they have unchanged content and they have a backup on disk, for example, it's part of the text segment of our program, we can always reload this from the executable file. Uh, so if we have something like this, we select one of these pages because we don't have to backup, we don't have to write out this page's contents uh, because we know we already have it on disk. And we can use this, uh, we can do this by using a special bit in the memory management entry, which we've seen already, the so-called dirty bit. So the dirty bit is kept in the page table entries to record if a write access has happened to that page since it has been brought in. And if the dirty bit is actually cleared, our page is clean, so it was not changed. So we can first try to find pages where the dirty bit is not set. Uh, yeah, so preemption of a page, uh, if its contents were changed, so the dirty bits a bit worse set, uh, implies that we are not allowed to just throw it away. We need this data later on because some process relies on it. So we have to save it to our paging space, to our swap space, to our background memory first. Uh, if we find out that we only have pages uh, with changed contents in our main memory. So the sequence of events that happens here is Whenever there is an access and the MMU figures out, okay, that page that was tried to access is not present in main memory, our MMU generates this page fault and traps into the operating system. If no free page frame is available, then it chooses a page to page out to background memory. Then uh, after that, it pages in the page that was originally requested into that page frame, which was allocated by the page we just paged out. And then, as we've seen, we need to repeat this memory access. So we need to repeat the exact instruction that has caused the page fault in the beginning. So our problem here is to choose which page should we actually page out when we are we're running out of free main memory. And we call this the victim page uh, because that's the one we shoot out of main memory, obviously. So determining this uh, involves looking at certain replacement strategies, so algorithms that determine which page to replace. And we will discuss these replacement strategies uh, with their effect on access sequences or access orders or also reference orders. So an access sequence is a sequence of page numbers. And this is uh, something like a trace of the behavior of a program when it's executed. So the sequence of page numbers represents the memory access behavior in time of a process. So uh, we need to determine these access sequences by recording the addresses that were actually accessed by a process. So for every instruction that accesses main memory because it was fetched from main memory, 
or uh, it loaded a value from main memory or it stored a value from main memory, we need to record the addresses that were involved in this uh, access. Then we need to reduce this large amount of data because for every instruction that's executed, we have at least one entry here for its own fetch. So what we do is we reduce the recorded sequence to only page numbers. So we ignore all the offsets inside of a page num uh, inside of a page and only look at the number of the page. And then if we have consecutive accesses to the same page, like we execute instructions one after the other and all of these instructions are in the same page. Of course, we don't have to uh, load this page from scratch every time because it's already in main memory then. Uh, so we can conflate these consecutive accesses if we have them all in a row, like address one, two, three, four, five, into accesses to the same page. And uh, to investigate uh, different replacement strategies, uh, we will look at an example access sequence here for page numbers one, two, three, four, then page number one, two, five, then one, two, three, four, five. So the first page that accessed was page one, then page two, then page three. So this is just a sequence in time here. So uh, since we cannot uh, really know about the forward distance, LRU tries to approximate this behavior by instead considering the backward distance. So the backward distance is actually the time that has passed since the last access to that page we're considering. So essentially we're looking at the page that was least recently used, LRU, and uh, this strategy can also be uh, called the strategy to replace the page with the largest backward distance. So let's take a look at our access sequence again. I hope that's not getting too boring here. So we start with an access to page number one, store it in a free frame, frame number one here, and update its backward distance. We just accessed, we just loaded it, so to zero here. Then we access page number two, load it into frame number two. We have a free one here. Uh, frame number two, its backward distance is, uh, is set to zero, whereas we increase the backward distance for our frame one. The same for frame three, and we update the backward distances accordingly. Now when this next request for frame number four comes in, uh, we ran out of free memory. So what we have to do now is to find a victim to replace. So we choose the page frame with the highest backward distance, which is that one here. So we load our frame, uh, or page four into frame number one. Well, unfortunately, then we access frame uh, page number one again. So we need to find another place for it. We've updated our backward distances, so now we need to uh, use frame number two, place it here. The same happens for, for uh, page two, which we now place into frame number three. And then we load page number five, and now frame one is the one with the largest backward distance, so we load it up here. Then we have two accesses to page one and two, which are already in memory, so we don't need to load anything here. We just need to update our backward distances here. And finally, we load page number three into frame number one, which now has the largest distance. And then we can continue with page number four and page number five here. So this LAU strategy is not as optimal as opt. So we require 10 page ins for the same access patterns and the same memory size compared to six. So we're not quite as good. So let's look at the behavior for a larger main memory with four instead of three page frames. And I won't go through all the table again, but it's a nice exercise for you to see that you really understood the behavior of the algorithms. So now we have four page frames, which means we have a lower memory pressure. We have one more frame to allocate, which means we only have eight page ends now instead of the 10 page ends with only three memory frames available. Now with LIU, we don't see this anomaly we've seen with FIFO. And in general, there's a class of algorithms, which we call stack algorithms, that can be shown not to show an anomaly. Uh, so for a stack algorithm with k page frames in main memory, the following holds that at every point in time, a subset of the pages is paged in into these k page frames that would also be paged in at the same time in a system with k plus one page frames. And you can compare it with our example with three and four page frames on the previous slides. So for LRU, which is one of the stack algorithms, the most recently used K pages are paged in. And for opt, if it would work, the K pages are the pages uh, which are paged in, which will be accessed next. Now, the problem is we've seen opt obviously is not implementable because we don't have a time machine to look into the future. 
uh, but also LIU needs some support to implement it. So we need to update these counters for each page, as we've seen, and we don't want to do it in software. This has quite some overhead. So implementing LIU requires some hardware support to do it efficiently. And we have to consider every memory access that takes place because we have to update our backward distances accordingly. So what could the hardware look like that could be used to support LIU? Let's start with a naive idea uh, that we implement some hardware support using counters. So the CPU would implement a counter that's incremented with every memory access. And for every memory access, the current counter value is actually written into the respective page descriptor. So uh, we actually do something like a negative uh, backward distance. So the page with the largest backward distance now has the lowest number because this counter always increases as time goes by. And so what we have to do for LRU is we have to select the page with the lowest counter value. Now the problem is that this can be any of these pages. So we have to perform a search for this page with the lowest counter value, which is of course a lot of overhead. So doing an implementation of LIU this way implies a large implementation overhead because we have to do many more access, uh, additional memory accesses. We also need quite a bit of additional memory to store these counter values because they're not only bits but maybe integer numbers. And finally, if a page fault occurs, we have to do a minimum search to find the lowest counter value page uh, which is going to be replaced in a critical section, not, not critical in terms of synchronization, but of timing, in our page fault handler. And this is obviously not the way we should do it.